the state of our health, something we strive to improve and maintain, but sometimes inadvertently destroy. Universally, it's vitally important. The Germans have a universal word for it. Gesundheit. In this edition, doggy delicacies. Are they inhumane and unnecessary, or just what the doctor ordered? Dog meat is prized in many parts of the world for its taste and health properties, but is it really a cut above the rest? British scientists have made a discovery that could help cure drug-resistant tumours. By switching off the body's natural defences to chemotherapy, they can ensure that optimum levels of the life-saving drugs are reaching the targeted areas. Over the past 12 years, Red Cross doctor Alberto Cairo has earned the nickname Mother Teresa of Kabul. During that time, he's seen five governments survive two civil wars and helped countless landmine victims to rebuild their lives. And the underwater exercise bike that dramatically reduces rehabilitation time, according to its German inventor. The secret lies in exercising in a weightless environment while the water reduces swelling at the same time. But first, Polly Henninger is one of over six million Americans who suffer from vertigo, an illness which literally turned her life upside down. At John Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, doctors diagnosed Henninger with Meniere's disease, a disorder caused by a buildup of fluid in the inner ear. Often during an attack, a patient's eyes will beat back and forth. These glasses help doctors detect that beating, known clinically as estagmus. Polly then got an antibiotic injection in her inner ear to deaden the nerves. Almost one in 10 people over 65 suffer from vertigo or other balance-related problems, and tests like these help in the diagnosis. Doctors warn that sudden dizziness could also indicate low blood pressure, vision problems, stroke, and even brain tumors. It's therefore imperative to seek treatment as soon as the symptoms appear. Fifty-four-year-old Jean Carfora went deaf over a year ago. Suddenly there was silence when only days earlier she could hear a pin drop. The boy fell from the window. But thanks to a new method that mimics how ears hear in tandem, Jean will now rely less on lip reading and more on her hearing. The boy fell from the window. Close. The boy fell from the window. Surgically placed in the inner ear, a beeper-like device sends impulses to stimulate the auditory nerve so Jean can decipher sound. These cochlear implants aren't new, but tuning them to each other is. Bill Shapiro, an audiologist at New York University, is working with Jean, the first patient to undergo this procedure. The hope is that the wearer will be able to localize sound and hear better in noisy environments. Jean will probably never hear normally and is still considered hearing impaired, but doctors say she'll grow more accustomed to the implants in the coming months. Like Jean, 28 million Americans suffer from significant hearing loss, yet as many as 23 million don't wear hearing aids. Financial considerations and cosmetic concerns are the most common excuses. The Songbird is the world's first disposable hearing aid, a discrete device that works like a traditional analog hearing aid but costs just $40 versus the $600 to $2,000 charge for the standard hearing aid. To help boost the hearing loss in his left ear, Lawrence Dunson began using the disposable device. Now he sees doctors every 40 days when the battery expires. For Lawrence, the Songbird truly marks the dawning of a new era. The disposable hearing aid is not suitable to all patients, particularly those with serious medical conditions. And because they're not custom fitted, some people are physically unable to use them. A digital version should be on the market within the next three years.
Ostrich is making its culinary debut in Chile and the lean cuisine is becoming quite the rave at upscale eateries. Farmer Cristobal Bascuan says his business began when he read about the quality of the meat on the internet. Ostrich steak is similar to beef in texture, taste and appearance, but it has two-thirds less fat than beef, less than half the fat of chicken and fewer calories than beef, chicken or turkey. The birds are also prolific breeders. An ostrich produces 40 or even 50 chicks a year. But the price isn't cheap. The iron-enriched, healthy red meat costs twice as much as regular beefsteak. Welcome to the house of Mwamba family, 20 kilometers east of central Kinshasa. Donati and Mwamba runs a small restaurant in his compound. Every day around lunchtime, the household prepares for the arrival of the first customers. Donatian and his clients start out drinking Latoko, a very strong local brew, while playing cards, listening to music and dancing. This looks like the beginning of a relaxing afternoon. At lunchtime, there's just one popular meal on the menu, dog. That's right, D-O-G. Dog meat is considered a delicacy in some regions of the Congo, especially by the Baluba tribes people, who believe the hounds are healthy for you too. Animal rights activists would be outraged, but Donatian isn't concerned. Man's best friend is just a nutritious meal to him. After a few minutes of bargaining, Donatian buys the dog for 1,700 Congolese francs. After being skinned, the carcass is singed to get rid of stray hair. Then it's washed carefully with soapy water and cut into pieces. The meat is cooked in tomato sauce with a lot of chili pepper and served with pounded leaves and cassava paste. Dog meat lovers swear that it's good for you. According to the locals, when you eat dog meat, your level of blood rises and you remain in good health. 13-year-old Henri Lusangi raises dogs in his backyard for sale. He sells puppies for the equivalent of one and a half dollars each. Henri has no shortage of customers. Today, even people who come from ethnic groups who don't usually eat it are adopting dog meat for economic reasons. The meat is thought to be especially nutritious and good to eat in the winter months because it heats up the body. Locals also believe it makes men strong and virile. In some countries, dogs are even beaten before being killed in order to increase the levels of adrenaline, which it's claimed will make a man more virile still. With hardly a health regulation to speak of, the Congo can be a very risky place for a meal, but people like Donatian and his loyal customers, who swear by the health-giving properties of the food, aren't about to give it a second thought. But what dog meat only claims to do, one odd little Peruvian plant actually does, and that's boost the libido. Researchers claim that maca, an ugly, smelly brown turnip found in the remote Andes, can boost a man's sex drive by up to 200%. Science may have finally dispelled the myth of the Latin lover. Maca is also said to reduce anxiety and even increase sperm count. Peru's maca export is currently bringing in between two and three million dollars and the latest research, which has not undergone independent review, could bolster sales even higher. Researchers at Boston's Children's Hospital believe they've discovered a new kind of cancer. Pathologists Sarah Vargas and Christopher French found a chromosomal swap in the cells of the tumor that makes this cancer unique. Researchers say this chromosomal translocation makes the cancer cells extremely aggressive. The disease has been documented in only six patients around the world. It started out with a simple sore throat for 13-year-old Isabella Calder, but nothing helped. Aggressive chemotherapy and radiation failed and Isabella died five months later. Researchers are well on the way to locating the genes on the chromosomes where the abnormality occurs. This could lead to treatments for this and possibly other cancers. 
The real challenge will be to figure out why these genes break apart in the first place and how to halt the process once it's begun. To Queensland, Australia, the Sunshine State. But it's not all fun in the sun. One in 17 Queenslanders develops melanoma, the highest skin cancer rate in the world. Some people are especially vulnerable because of their genetic makeup. According to Dr. Rick Sturm of the University of Queensland, the gene that determines red or ginger hair when coupled with a known skin cancer gene vastly increases the risk of melanoma, and a cancer develops at a younger age. Hair colour isn't the whole story. Genetics can play tricks. People can carry the red hair gene and not have red hair. Childhood testing would give an early warning of a person's genetic predisposition to melanoma, but it can't determine how people will behave. Whether we have the gene or not, doctors advise that it's how well we protect ourselves in the sun that determines whether we face much risk or not. After discovering several growths on his skin, Jim Latrude began using a cream normally prescribed for external warts. Known as Aldara, it's been found to be effective in clearing up skin cancer. The cream works by boosting production of certain naturally occurring proteins which help healing. Jim has had patches of non-melanoma cancer for eight years. He used to have them surgically removed but now prefers the cream. Unlike surgery, the cream treatment retains the skin's pigment, so the treated area is protected from the sun. Clinical trials have shown Aldara to be 90% effective at treating non-melanoma skin cancer, and it's hoped it'll gain FDA approval in around two years' time. And scientists at the Imperial College in London claim they've made a discovery that could cure drug-resistant cancerous tumours and save thousands of lives. Most types of cancerous tumours respond to chemotherapy, but they can later develop resistance to drugs, which makes effective treatment difficult. A key protein has now been identified which actually fights against treatment. The P glycoprotein stops the chemotherapy from doing its job, killing the cancerous tumours. This new discovery means that scientists can develop drugs to block the protein, allowing the chemotherapy to destroy the cancer. Doctors believe this discovery will help treat many types of cancer, such as breast, prostate and leukaemia. According to the World Health Organization, cancer is a leading cause of death in most industrialized countries. Worldwide, 10 million people contract the disease every year, with lung, stomach, liver and breast cancers being the biggest killers. Afghanistan has more landmines than any other country in the world. It's estimated that up to 8 million of the deadly weapons still lie in wait. The US campaign to rout out the Taliban inadvertently forced thousands of refugees to flee their villages, often straight into minefields. As a result, the number of injuries and deaths suddenly skyrocketed. A visit to an orthopedic center in Kabul illustrates the human cost of 23 years of war in one of the world's poorest nations. In just the past 12 years in Afghanistan, Alberto Cairo has seen five governments survive two civil wars and helped countless people disabled by landmines and rockets to build their lives. Through the bloody warlord era after the Soviet withdrawal and the austere years of Taliban rule, the flamboyant Italian has worked as head of the International Committee of the Red Cross Orthopaedic Project, earning the name Mother Teresa of Kabul. His center treats around 300 invalids a day, 80% of them landmine victims, and often treatment, training and counseling to help them reintegrate into society. Cairo and his staff encourage their patients to learn to walk again with prostheses and go on with their lives not to think that their lives are over, as so many do. Before the bombing, around 90 people a month were killed or maimed by landmines. The number now stands at over 550. Half the victims die before reaching what few medical facilities still exist. So in reality, these patients are the lucky ones. 
Since it began in Kabul in 1988, the International Committee of the Red Cross Orthopedic Project has also opened centers in Herat, Mazar-i-Sharif, Jalalabad, Gulbahar, and Faizabad. The Kabul center operated during the decade-long Soviet occupation when most of the minefields were first laid out and continued its work through the Taliban era, not least because of some of its patients were Taliban, although men had to be strictly segregated from women. As well as manufacturing and fitting prosthetic limbs, the center provides jobs in its workshops and rehabilitation rooms to disabled people. According to Cairo, himself a former lawyer from Turin who retrained as a physiotherapist to join the Red Cross project, the center only employs disabled people as a form of positive discrimination. He believes it shows everyone that disabled people can work as well as their able-bodied countrymen and women. The Taliban eventually forced Cairo to leave Kabul a few days after the September 11th attacks on the United States but he was back by the end of November, a few days after the Taliban fell. Cairo breathed a sigh of relief when a new interim government under Hamid Karzai was sworn in soon after that, with a mandate to rebuild the nation with a massive injection of international aid. The World Bank recently estimated that Afghanistan needed at least $9 billion to rebuild its economy and basic infrastructure. Following a year of terrorism, war and devastating natural disasters, the British Red Cross is aiming to raise more funds to be used immediately for disaster situations. Not all disasters receive international press limiting the capacity for charities to raise money. Through their new disaster fund initiative, the British Red Cross hopes to be able to respond quickly to anyone in need around the globe. Recently, for example, an earthquake hit southern Peru and 60,000 people were left homeless. It didn't get much news coverage, but it did devastate an entire community. Within 48 hours, 50,000 blankets were sent from the British Red Cross to the Peruvian Red Cross to support those affected. With over 130 years of experience, the British Red Cross plays an important role on the world stage and continues to work under two fundamental principles, neutrality and humanity. African dance, coupled with step aerobics, is helping Deborah Bono's students dance their way to health and fitness. Her husband, Jean, provides the beat for the class. It's his drumming, along with her endless energy, that drives these women to reach new aerobic highs. Bono started teaching the class about five years ago, when a client asked her to come up with something a little different. She used to dance background to design Afro-Caribbean steps. Its popularity draws people from all cultures and nationalities. The couple have even produced two workout tapes to promote their exercise system around the world in the hopes that it will be enjoyed by people in their living rooms and in the gym. Speaking of gyms, a German doctor had borrowed some exercise equipment and modified it to treat injuries and other physical disorders. The underwater bicycle dramatically reduces rehabilitation time for patients with leg injuries. Martin Hartkopf is one of Dr. Van Katten's patients. He recently underwent surgery for tearing his cruciate ligament while playing basketball. The ligaments hold the knees in place, providing stability and flexibility. Conventional rehabilitation takes about 14 weeks and hydrotherapy is only introduced in the later stages. Patients are normally able to straighten their knees after 10 weeks, but studies show that people training on the underwater bicycle could flex their legs after just six weeks. The secret lies in exercising in a weightless environment. 
In other sports news, Impact Leisure International has developed a new ski slope surface, which will give skiers a softer, easier landing. The injury-free invention, known as Playgrass, is made of two layers of geotextile material and is gap-free, which means fingers and thumbs can't get trapped in a fall. The company has already had considerable interest from Mexico, the Far East and several European countries including Italy, Spain and Portugal. Those who've already tried the new slopes claim the surface offers more turning ability and is even more slippery than normal skiing, but without the bruising. Playgrass is an ideal surface for beginners who can be somewhat apprehensive about flying down a snow-capped peak, while seasoned skiers tend to be more adventurous on the man-made surface, as they're less likely to hurt themselves. The company has had particular interest from America, where personal injury concerns have until now stopped the development of the dry ski slope industry. And finally, in sports medicine, the illegal use of performance-enhancing drugs has taken a dangerous turn, thanks to gene therapy. It seems that winning is in the genes after all. Scientists at University College London studying cardiovascular genetics have identified the first seven genes associated with human performance. While their work is being designed to help those with serious illness, it's feared it could be illegally used by athletes. By understanding how these sporting genes work in regulating performance, opportunists might find pharmaceutical ways of enhancing the body, much like the human hormone EPO was copied and used by cyclists to enhance their strength, stamina and riding ability. Research in this field is just getting started, so matching the right genes to types of performance is still a long way off. At some point though, it could lead to the arrival of gene drugs, which would be very difficult to detect. The state of our health, something we strive to improve and maintain, but sometimes inadvertently destroy. Universally, it's vitally important. The Germans have a universal word for it. Gesundheit. In today's edition, the future has arrived at a hospital in Mexico City, where surgeons have teamed up with Zeus, a surgical robot to remove abdominal tumors with minimal invasion and exceptional precision. Russian President Vladimir Putin has called on his countrymen and women to take up sport and cast off the nation's image as unhealthy drunkards who are dying well before their time. Thirty-five years ago, in a quiet suburb of London, the modern hospice movement was born. St. Christopher's Hospice is still at the center of the movement setting the pace in research into pain and innovative ways of helping the terminally ill and the bereaved. 
and a recent study conducted on 2,000 women showed that those over 24 with no history of heart problems were at a slightly higher risk of having a heart attack if they were on oral contraceptives. But first, imagine preparing a crack pipe as part of a new addiction therapy program. The drugs are fake, but the cravings are real. This is ERP, Exposure Response Prevention, a rather unconventional therapy. 38-year-old alcoholic L begins her session with relaxation exercises. Then she repeats personalized mantras called cognitive scripts, which drum in the many reasons to quit. Then it's the hard part. She's confronted with the drug which ruined her life. ERP flies in the face of conventional therapy. But according to these addicts, the only way to beat their drug demon is to literally face it head on. <laughs> Counseling isn't always enough for alcoholics, and some need medication too. A new study has called into question whether the popular drug naltrexone often prescribed to recovering alcoholics to suppress their cravings, really works. Research in the New England Journal of Medicine found that older men who drank heavily for over 20 years often didn't respond to the drug. All volunteers in the study, whether they received the drug or a placebo, underwent individual counseling and were encouraged to attend Alcoholics Anonymous, a key component in treatment. The National Institutes of Health is funding several additional studies on new medications, most of which target specific areas of the brain that respond to alcohol. And speaking of drugs, a new study concluded that a popular vitamin supplement can actually be bad for you. The American Medical Association has indicated that too much vitamin A could double older women's chance of hip fractures. Most damaging was vitamin A found as retinol in vitamin supplements, fortified cereal, liver and fish oils. Vitamin A in the beta-carotene form of leafy green vegetables had no link. Researchers found that postmenopausal women with the highest total intake of retinol had double the risk of hip fractures than women with the lowest intake. Doctors aren't sure why, but some think that too much retinol vitamin A either inhibits the body's calcium absorption or affects bone cell production. Doctors advise patients to continue taking multivitamins as they can prevent other diseases. Patients should also choose beta-carotene sources of vitamin A or limit their retinol sources to 500 micrograms a day. Speaking at a news conference in Berlin, German and American lawyers announced their plans to bring forward an amended class action against Bayer Pharmaceuticals in the United States. Bayer's cholesterol-reducing medication Lipobay has allegedly led to the deaths of at least 50 people worldwide and to health defects in at least 2,000 patients. The lawyer representing the German victims, Michael Vitti, told journalists that the lawsuit will be presented to a court in Minneapolis. Vitti stated it was important to provide both German and international victims of the biomedication with an equal chance of being compensated under American law. Just recently, Bayer had to take Lipa Bay off the market due to unsolved deaths allegedly caused by it. The US lawyer, Kenneth Moll, working with Vitti on the case, stated that Lipobay had been developed and tested by the U.S. Bayer branch of the Bayer Corporation, and accordingly, the case should be tried in the U.S. Currently, more than 50 deaths worldwide seem to be connected with Lipobay, despite Bayer's claims that a connection cannot be proven. The lawsuit will not only be directed against Bayer AG and Bayer Corporation, but also against Europe's biggest pharmaceutical company, GlaxoSmithKline. Smith Klein Beecham has been accused of having participated in the sale and marketing of Lipo Bay in the US throughout the past decade.
Tula Westlake is having the time of her life on a five-star vacation viewing animals in the African bush. But her trip is more than just relaxation. She's one of the growing number of scalpel safari tourists coming to South Africa for a nip and tuck and then recuperating while on safari. A few days earlier, she went under the knife in a Johannesburg clinic. During five hours of surgery, she had a breast lift and enlargement, plus a tummy tuck and liposuction. Tula was thrilled with the results and felt she got value for money. Patients first relax at luxurious hotels before entering hospital for their cosmetic surgery. During this procedure, an inch of skin was removed from either side of the face and the muscles were pulled back. It's not going to be painful. The patient recovers in hospital before the safari begins. The mix of adventure and cosmetic enhancement is bringing much needed revenue to the beleaguered South African economy. And the future has arrived for those who can afford it at a Mexico City hospital where Zeus, a surgical robot, can remove abdominal tumors with surgeons operating at long distance and with minimum invasion. Zeus became operable in Mexico City last September and is the same robot used in the first ever long distance surgery in which a doctor in New York removed the spleen of a patient in Strasbourg, France, some 6,000 miles away. Zeus and three other new devices make up a family of robots used in minimally invasive surgeries. With high precision instruments, doctors work through five to ten millimeter incisions instead of fully exposed abdomens. Popular wisdom advises against starting anything at midpoint, but surgery starting at the navel makes it easier to introduce a camera to the abdomen. The technique has been refined to the point of having this procedure performed as routine. Sitting at a chair in front of the controls, surgeons maneuver the robotic arms to remove damaged tissue, suture the cut and return the stomach to its proper position. Stitches and sutures are cut with electricity to avoid any internal bleeding and the whole procedure can be watched on several monitors. Surgery concludes successfully while 30 similar procedures are pending approval all around the world. And our surgical rounds end today with a tall order from a short woman. We're at the Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland where internationally known surgeons Dr. Paley and Dr. Herzenberg will perform a limb lengthening procedure on 20-year-old Meredith Jones. Meredith suffers from a chondroplasia or dwarfism and stands 127 centimeters tall, but over the next three years she hopes to grow 25.4 centimeters taller. During the procedure, Paley will place three screws into Jones's humerus bone to aid in the procedure, doctors will rely on imaging technology to show them the exact placement of the screw. Together, the surgeons have performed more than 4,000 of these operations and can complete their work on a limb in less than an hour. Dr. Paley carefully breaks Meredith's bones and locks them into place with an external fixture. For the next seven months, she'll rotate the screw four times daily to lengthen her bones. The device works by gradually pulling the broken bone apart, which will then be filled in by new bone. The stark contrast between these two young women, a former patient who's completed the three-year limb lengthening process and another patient just beginning the procedure, shows the dramatic results of this cutting-edge surgery. Russia's President Vladimir Putin is on a health drive. He wants his countrymen to get fit, stay off drink and live longer. The leader's recent statement was aimed at drinkers and smokers in Russia, where it's not unusual to see people of all ages smoking and drinking beer, sometimes in the morning on their way to work. 
Putin, the first Kremlin leader who is known to despise alcohol and cigarettes, told a meeting of the country's state council recently that the state of the nation's health was shameful. The Russian president, a black belt in judo and a keen skier, has called on political figures to take the lead in promoting a healthier lifestyle for all Russians. Some politicians have been quick to respond to the president's call. Russian Deputy Premier Valentina Matvienko and ultra-nationalist politician Vladimir Zirinovsky recently took part in a cross-country skiing competition with their leader. The core of the problem is that sports in Russia have all but fallen off the political radar screen since the breakup of the Soviet Union. Latest statistics must make for unhappy reading back at the Kremlin. Only 10% of Russia's 150 million people take part in sports. Average life expectancy is 59 for men and 72 for women. But Russian women don't live longer because they're fitter. It's just that alcohol kills the men first. It's a rich irony that today's Russia boasts world-class athletes, including many professionals scattered all over the world. But this elite band of sports professionals has no grassroots in Russian society itself. Over the past decade, the country's sports facilities have been neglected and are crumbling due to the lack of funding a far cry from Mother Russia's former glory. Today, a small but growing middle class is pumping iron. They clearly think that a fitness club membership is money well spent. At this expensive Moscow health club, members believe they're adding at least an extra five to ten years to their lives. The problem is, health clubs with state-of-the-art facilities are priced well above the means of ordinary Russians, and affordable sports facilities are almost non-existent in small Russian cities. At one of Moscow's few junior gymnastics schools, eight to ten-year-old girls twirl batons and do stretching exercise. It's a Soviet-era sports facility, but the best that the parents of these children can afford. Putin has called on Russian businesses to help fund cheaper and more widely accessible sporting facilities. The nation's health has now become a matter of public policy. Whether Putin will win the contest to stop the rot still remains to be seen. But with state funding all but dried up, many locals don't believe that businesses alone could do enough. As the Russians have discovered, where you live could have a profound impact on your health. The New England Medical Journal found that study participants who developed cardiovascular disease were more likely to live in disadvantaged neighborhoods. Whites living in such neighborhoods were found to have a 70 to 90 percent higher risk of coronary disease, while blacks had a 30 to 50 percent greater risk. Factors that contribute to illness include the lack of public spaces and recreational facilities, increased tobacco advertising, and the unavailability of healthy foods. Researchers also believe that exposure to noise, violence and poverty can contribute as well. Modern hospices offer people with incurable diseases professional medical help to control pain and just as importantly, emotional support for themselves and their loved ones. But it wasn't always like this. In the 1940s, patients and their families were often distressed by a hospital system which wasn't set up to care for the terminally ill. Working as a nurse back then, Dame Cicely Saunders found little help available for patients with terminal illness. She decided to devote her life to improving care for the dying. She even trained as a doctor, researching new ways to control pain. In 1967, Dame Cicely founded St. Christopher's Hospice in South London. It was the world's first teaching hospice, combining clinical care with teaching and research, as it still does today. St. Christopher's cares for over 1,600 patients a year. Some are admitted to the 50-bed inpatient unit, but most are cared for at home by the doctors, nurses and social workers of the hospice's home care teams, 
an innovation pioneered by this hospice. Since its foundation, St Christopher's has been at the forefront of research for the care of the dying, which has now developed into a recognised medical specialty, palliative medicine. The regular and safe giving of oral morphine to control pain was first done at this hospice. One day a week, inpatients and those cared for at home are offered activities at the day centre including craft work, aromatherapy, painting and creative writing. The aim is to counter the feelings of helplessness and isolation that chronic illness can produce. A resident artist offers coaching and advice. He can even bring a patient's artistic vision to reality if they're too weak to hold a brush. The centre also offers more formal art therapy sessions to help people to get in touch with feelings they may not be able to otherwise express. It's also about getting people in touch with their strengths as well. The supportive and positive atmosphere of the hospice comes as a welcome surprise to many who come here. Over 50,000 health professionals have passed through the various palliative care training schemes run by the hospice and despite the vast number of books, journals and reports available, they find that the patients are still the best teachers. Now there's a growing interest in the needs of the dying in developing countries, especially with the increasing burden of AIDS-related deaths. 70% of the world's hospices are now in developing countries and St. Christopher's offers training for all. The idea is to take the latest research based on clinical experiences and adapt them to various communities around the world. The Hospice Information Service offers advice to members on all aspects of setting up and running a hospice. It also puts travelling patients in touch with hospices overseas. A recent St Christopher's patient who wanted to make a final trip to Kenya before she died was able to find out about a hospice in Nairobi. Care at the hospice is completely free of charge, while half their running costs come from the government. The rest is raised by the staff. Last year St Christopher's won the Conrad Hilton Prize the Million Dollar Award was in recognition of the pioneering work of the hospice in bringing light to the previously misunderstood or ignored world of the dying and their families. Each year, more than 220,000 people die of sudden death in the United States due to cardiac arrest. Death occurs from an abrupt loss of the heart's ability to pump. Scientists have long known that high levels of free fatty acids can trigger irregular rhythms in people with heart disease. But in a recent French report, healthy men with elevated levels of free fatty acids are also at a higher risk of sudden death. Free fatty acids are released into the bloodstream when needed for energy. In low amounts, they're not considered dangerous. One beneficial dietary fat, omega-3 fatty acids found in fish like salmon and tuna, may actually also help lower a person's risk of sudden death. Researchers are now suggesting that routine measurement of free fatty acids may help identify individuals at high risk of sudden death. Another study just published in the New England Journal of Medicine confirms that women with no previous cardiac problems who take oral contraceptives have a slightly higher risk of heart attack. There has been debate for some time surrounding the effect of the pill on women's cardiac health. Evidence that it may cause blood clots in the heart first appeared in the 1960s. Since then, manufacturers progressively lowered the doses of estrogen. According to gynaecologist Dr. Nancy Garber, the benefits still outweigh the risks, but women should still consult their doctor. This study, conducted on nearly 2,000 Dutch women, showed that those over age 24 with no history of heart problems were at a slightly higher risk of having a heart attack if they're on oral contraceptives. If they also smoke, have high cholesterol, diabetes or high blood pressure, the risk is nearly 13 times greater. 
Two recently approved hormone-based birth control products for women are now on the market in the United States. The birth control patch and a vaginal ring both release estrogen, so they too may increase the risk of heart problems. And from Britain, celebrations for the opening of a $5.4 million centre, designed to bring some of the country's leading heart scientists under one roof. Former heart patient Lord Michael Heseltine opened the centre which was made possible by the British Heart Foundation's largest ever grant. Some years ago, Lord Heseltine himself suffered a major heart attack. Four of Britain's top specialists will lead a team of more than 120 researchers. They'll be looking at the underlying processes which can cause heart disease and ways of preventing and treating it. Heart disease is one of humanity's greatest foes and an urgent need exists to understand it and then defeat it as quickly as possible. Sentiments that two-year-old heart patient Jack Waller would surely agree on.